And if I were to ask believers that are here today that have trusted Jesus as their Savior, do you think the time would ever come that you would deny Jesus? I hope that your answer would be no. I'd die before I betrayed my Lord. I hope that would be my answer. Wouldn't you hope so? And I think that's what's astounding about these men like Peter. Now, <clears throat> if you just study the character and the personality of Peter, I don't take Peter to be a sissy. I don't have the impression that the guy who is surrounded by all these people that came to take Jesus in this very text we're looking at today, pulls out a sword and whacks off a guy's ear, is afraid. He's not a coward. He's not afraid to die. But the thing is, is that he hasn't been called to die. What he's been called to do is much more difficult than dying. I've said before, and I hope that you'll take this into consideration, that anyone can die. Dying's not complicated. Everybody who's ever been born has done it. And so anyone is capable of dying. But living for Jesus, my friend, is a whole other matter entirely. And being a disciple is living for Jesus, and that's much more complicated. Well, uh, lest I should get in too much introductory material this morning, let's just get into our message and look at a couple of simple truths that I think ought to help us. Uh, I want to just say to you this morning that our relationship with God is based upon facts. Our relationship with God is based upon facts. Now, we live in a society that diminishes the value of facts, right? Uh, just go to school sometime and look at the political correctness uh, with facts. For instance, you have a sports game in Little League now, uh, Pee Wee, whatever the little kid's t-ball is, and they go out, usually most leagues, now some of them wouldn't, I'd never put my kid in one that did this, but most leagues just go out and they play ball, but they don't have score, they don't keep score, they don't really call anyone out, uh, they don't really have winners, and they don't really have losers. And the reason for it is I think it's damaging for a kid to think that he's a loser. And um, I suppose that perhaps it is. But the fact is, is that if he didn't win, that's what he is. And uh, we're very careful to be politically correct with the matter of condemning anyone. For instance, uh, a lot of Christians today just don't think it's right or they're being very careful about saying that Jesus Christ is the exclusive means for salvation. The fact is that if Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he wasn't the only way for salvation, then the scripture says he died in vain. It was a waste for God to send his perfect son to die on the cross for people that had an alternative uh, way, means of redemption. The fact is, is that Christ is very exclusive. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Not either that's true or that's a lie. But the fact is, is that God does not allow any room for latitude with that. Either Jesus is the only way for salvation, those who believe in him will never perish, and those who make a choice of unbelief will burn forever in hell. Either that's a fact or it's a lie. I just want to tell you something, though. If it's just kind of maybe true, then it's not a very great truth. There are a lot of things that the Bible teaches, friend, that if they're not absolutely true, they're worthless. And our redemption is, I would suppose, the greatest one of those. If Jesus is not the means to eternal life, then, friend, uh, what alternative is it? What's worth anything? Nothing is. Oh, there's some other facts. The Bible's either true or it's not. What good is a book with mistakes? Either the Bible is what it claims to be, and that is that it's God's perfect preserved word, or it's not. And if it's not, then you have to ask yourself the question, how much is true and how much error is permissible in a book that God claims to be perfect? Because if God says it's perfect, he does, by the way. If he says it's perfect and it's not, then he's a liar. And he's not a very good God to worship and to serve, and you can't trust him. You can't trust a liar. Did you know that? Listen, try hiring a guy that's a liar or a thief, and just see if you can win in that situation. Eventually, he'll get you. And it's a fact. And you can't have a God in heaven who is either holy or not, who is either perfect or not, He's either what he claims to be or he isn't. And if he isn't God, then he's not worth worshiping and it's all a lie. I want to say to you this morning that God is real. He's alive. I'll tell you a couple ways I know so. The first way I know so is because the Bible says so. The greatest claim in the scripture that Jesus is God is that the greatest testimony, the greatest evidence is that the scripture says so. That's the greatest evidence. The second evidence is those who saw him. And, and uh, they were the secondary witnesses. And I'm, I'm like that myself. I believe because the Bible says so, but I have the Holy Spirit living in me. 
And that's something that someone without Christ does not have. That's different when you're saved. Everything's different when you're saved and you become a new creature in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, uh, old things are passed away, all things are become new. And that's a fact. And it happened to me, and so I know by personal experience it's true. But I'm telling you something, whether or not my experience corroborated the fact, it's still a fact. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God and He's the only means for eternal life. Now, uh, but I just want to tell you something. Truth's important. It's, it's exclusive. If this is true, then this is not. If this guy wins, this guy loses. It's that sort of thing. And you know, uh, I think that the whole concept of not being able to say somebody is wrong or that there is error anywhere, I don't think that is, an, that is a concept that's invented to help people believe in God. I think it's another delusion to help people believe a lie that there's an alternative to God. You see, Satan's not, he wasn't born yesterday, by the way. He was born thousands of years ago, created thousands and thousands of years ago. And he's been around a while, and he's already pretty smart and intelligent anyway. And he's got ways of tricking people, and he doesn't trick you by coming and telling you a bold-faced lie. He comes and tells you something that's sort of a lie. And that's how he deceives individuals. But I want to uh, get to our point this morning. It really has to do with the practicality of prayer. Let me just say this this morning. If God does not answer a prayer, He's not the God of the Bible. If, or the Bible has mistakes and it lies about God. You know, I've heard so much preaching and teaching on prayer that allows God room for escape. In other words, well, God always answers prayer, but sometimes His answer is no. Well, God always answers prayer, but uh, there are conditions for prayer. Friend, there are conditions for prayer. But I just want to tell you something. The Bible has some absolute statements about prayer. One of them is a promise to individuals who have believed in Jesus. Everyone who is saved has this promise. And I think the first answer to prayer God ever answers is the prayer to be saved. And if God doesn't answer the prayer to be saved, He's a liar. I know many individuals say, well, I prayed and asked God to save me. I want Him to, but you know, I don't really think I got saved at that time. Friend, if God said He'd save you for asking and He didn't, then God's a liar. His word's not so. And God says in His Word in John chapter 5 and verse 14 and 15, I think everyone here probably could quote it, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. And friend, if you ask God for anything that He wants, the promise is that He will answer your prayer, and if He answers your prayer, you'll have what you asked for. Now, I don't know about you, but there's all kind of individuals that like to give God a way out to not answer prayer. I think what they really are is a way out for us not to meet the conditions of prayer and to blame it on God so that we don't look like we're not good Christians. I want to tell you something. If God's not answering your prayer, and I want to just state this this morning, if God does not answer your prayer, you're not a good Christian. I'm not saying you're not saved this morning, I'm not making that statement at all, but I want to propose to you this morning that if God does not answer your prayer, if you cannot look back in the recent history at answers to prayer in your life, there's something wrong with the way you're living your Christian life. 